oldguytalks.com is all about being a better man. Join me on this kick-ass journey. Exclusive stuff for members only in the Old Guy Cave. Opt in now. This is Oris, the old guy from www.oldguytalks.com. Talking to you tonight with David Laird, brand ambassador for the Balvenie Scotch Whiskey. But before we get into that, as I told you, if you opt in at oldguytalks.com, I will show you, I will tell you three ways, three ways how to get laid more frequently without begging. That's right. You don't have to turn in your man card. You don't have to be that pathetic guy asking to get laid. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more pathetic and just unsexy than a guy begging to get laid. So I will tell you three ways how to do that and still keep your man card. Still keep your man card. That's right. It's very important. So tonight we got David Laird, uh, who was raised in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, this area is steeped in whiskey, trading, and blending. And David has entertained consumers, press, and trade with his knowledge and experience from within the whiskey industry since joining the Balvany in 2013. David has been on over 100 TV shows. Matter of fact, people ask him for his autograph all the time, <laughs> including Bloomberg and Fox TV. And he was nominated as icon as an icon of whiskey. I think there's a picture of him in a church somewhere, folks. He has an icon. I think that's usually some sort of religious thing. Uh, he's also a smart dude. Uh, the man has, just to, so you don't think he's a one-dimensional kind of guy, he has two degrees, one in biology and the other in environmental science. He is also a stud jock. He came to the United States on a soccer scholarship in, in Tennessee. And uh, upon graduation, he moved to Portland, Oregon, where he owned a successful whiskey bar with over 500, count them, 500, that's a lot to count, different kinds of whiskeys. Now, Balvenie is created by malt master David Stewart, who is in his 50th year at the distillery. I guess he likes his job if he's been there for 50 years. Yeah, 55 years. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only distillery that grows its own barley, uses traditional floor maltings. You're going to have to tell us what that's what those are. Keeps Coppersmith and Coopers on site, thereby making the Balvenie the most handcrafted of malts. And the distillery is owned by Grant & Son Holdings for over five years generations that's a long time five generations so david welcome welcome to oldguytalks.com and why don't you tell us a little bit about what is the process of distilling a scotch whiskey yeah there's a there's a lot goes into it um first i just want to clear one little thing up i actually okay. owned a bar in memphis tennessee and i oh. managed a bar in oregon I don't oh, want okay. my, my buddy Josh and Jim thinking I'm claiming all their credit for their bar up there in uh, in Portland. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I managed a bar called Paddy's Whiskey House up there in Portland down in the southwest. And uh, the okay. bar in Memphis I owned was uh, the Celtic Crossing, which the guy I started it with, he now owns it outright. It's a cool bar. Okay. It's been going forever. And, uh, yeah, we've had uh, a good little fun on the – being on that side of the bar, talking about whiskey and collecting whiskey and – holding whiskey classes, and then I jumped to this fun side of the business of not worrying about inventory and hoping people show up to work. You just get to go around and talk and whiskey. Pay, and payroll and everything else. Yeah, <laughs> all that kind of nonsense stuff you got to deal with when you own the bar. Uh, but we've uh, – no, the, what goes on the whiskey is a little bit different. With How we make it with Scotland is a little bit different than how you make it around the world. Uh, there's a couple of set rules, especially mostly to do with the ingredients. Uh, obviously, it's got to be made in Scotland, but – uh, we can only use barley, yeast, and water to make a good single malt whiskey in Scotland. Oh. And if you look at different uh, parts of the world, just say America, since we're over here just now, they can use a lot of different grains, the corn and the wheat and the rye and the barley and other experiment with things like quinoa and different things like that as well. And mm -hmm. Scotland's pretty strict. We can only use barley, yeast, and water. So we use those three main ingredients. And essentially what we talked about with we malt barley is essentially turning the starch in the barley, start to get that to turn into sugar. And we do that just by soaking the water and turning it itself, and that allows it to start germinating, and, and it automatically starts changing the starch into sugar over time. It takes about six days, and uh, we used to be done in a big floor about twice the size of a basketball court, but eight inches deep and turned by hand. And most of that's gone now. Uh, so we're down to, I think, just six distilleries now who are doing it by hand. And we're one of the last guys in the Highlands who do it. So it's a really 
traditional way of making the whiskey, but it's it's kind of a cool thing you see when you go. That's what if I go back to the distillery, that's the one little job they let me do is go in there and put a little bit of uh, manual labor in and turn the barley and get get involved a little bit, which uh, there's a couple more super technical parts that I'm not allowed to touch or go near, but they uh, <laughs> mopped in the barley, they let me add a little elbow grease every now and again, so it helps. Well, that's out. That sounds like a, that sounds like a good time. So let's talk about uh, where in Scotland the Balvany is located and what makes it so special. Uh, what 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 is the making of it that makes it so special? Um, I say we have a whiskey first, and then I'll tell you because that's what really makes it special. So uh, <laughs> I know uh, you got a little bottle out there as well. I'm going to have a little twelve uh, year double wood whiskey. I, I think we're going to start. We're going to start with that, folks. Uh, so David was very very so kind that's to the single send bottle me some you got stuff. there. That's right. We can, and, we can jump on that one. Okay, I, whichever one you want to start because I got I, I got them all out here. Let's and, start with that one you got in your hand, a little single bottle whiskey. Okay. And I, uh, if we're going to talk about whiskey, we may as well be drinking a whiskey. That's what I think. That's right. That's absolutely that. It just <laughs> wouldn't make any sense doing any yeah. otherwise. You've already so. got your cigar going there, so I got to join you a little bit. <laughs> all right. So I got myself a little bit poured and. And uh, while we're doing that pour, uh, let's maybe uh, you know talk to, you talked a little bit about water, adding just a touch of water to it. Yeah, last time we were hanging out in Arizona together, uh, we were going through about adding some water to the whiskey, and what you're essentially doing is bringing some of the flavor that's in the whiskey into. It's, some of them are water soluble, so they actually come into solution when you add a little water, mm. so that allows the flavor to come out. But it also allows some of this whiskey. I mean, this one's forty-seven point eight. ABV, so it's pretty high up there. So when you add the the water, it helps lower the alcohol, so a little bit more of your taste buds can open up, and you can taste a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Allows you keeping your palate a little bit longer as well. A lot of people like to taste it without water first, uh -huh. see what that tastes like, and then add the water and see how it changes. But I've I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing to say. I've drank this whiskey many, many times, and uh, I know what I'm looking for. I know the exact amount of water I'm trying to add to it, but I encourage people to experiment, see uh -huh. what kind of water you like. Sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's just a little bit. And each whiskey is going to be different as well. But for this one, this is the 12-year-old single barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, that means there's only – we took one barrel that was aged in distillery and we bottled that one. Um, we only got uh, 350 bottles out of that barrel. Um, so a really small amount of whiskey coming out of there. Um, so we're drinking something pretty unique. And uh, mm. took 12 years to make. It just lay in a, a warehouse, got old, mm. and then we bottled it. And uh, it gives this beautiful American sweet honey vanilla oakiness. So it's delicious. It's okay. one of my favorites. I mean. Yeah. So what's what's um, let's talk a little bit about the wood and the barrel and, uh, yeah. and the process there. Tell, tell yeah. So I think you were asking earlier, we, we had a space side whiskey. So we're up in the north uh, east of Scotland, up there mm. in that direction, up in the Highlands. And space side is a very – specific region we're right next to our sister distillery called Fittick. okay and, uh, we've been around since 1892 and we've been kind of trying to keep as we talk about being a handcrafted distillery for me it's more about the people who are there and the skill that these guys and women put into making the whiskey they're some of them are dedicated their whole lives like you were mentioning uh, david stewart 55 years i mean he started when he was 17 that's i mean it's wow. been all the way back to generations and just dedicate their life to learning one thing and perfecting that one skill. And today we, we tend to jump around. And we just talked about I've worked in three different industries. And we do. We jump around industries now and change jobs. And there's something amazing about people who just dedicate their life to perfecting one craft. And um, one of the things we have is a cooperage on site. And those guys are able to make and maintain barrels at the distillery. And uh, all the barrels are coming from America, where these ones came from, the ex-bourbon barrels. Uh, but we use European sherry casks and port casks and Madeira and lots of different things. And these couplers are able to either mend them or fix them or check them, or we can actually start experimenting with doing new toasts on the, the barrels. Mm. Uh, to this day, we are one of the only single malts that actually have a fully functioning uh, cooperage on site now. Well, I just tell you, have one or two coopers. We've got a full cooperage that looks after all our our barrels for us in Glenfiddich and things. So it makes a huge difference. So, to us. so the the coopers they basically what basically they work with with which part the is it the barrel? I'm, 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 yeah, a cooper is someone. If you go back, if you ever meet somebody called Cooper, a Steve Cooper or Mary Cooper, 
back in the generations, they, one of their family would have been a cooper. Uh -huh. And a cooper is someone who makes and maintains barrels. Okay. So going all the way back, it's a very, very ancient craft because you can go back to Egyptian time and all these different times where sure. barrels were being made. And essentially, it's not changed very much. Uh, there's a little bit of machines that help move some of the barrels around and do things like that. But the actual building of a barrel hasn't really changed much since you go back to the, the beginning times. It's still just wood. It used to be wooden hoops, but now it's metal hoops. But it's just wood and hoops and a little bit of tension holds it all together. And uh, it's a lot of craft. It takes a four-year apprenticeship to become a cooper. Wow. So it's a long time of dedication because some of this whiskey is going to sit in there for uh, 50, 55 years we just released last year. Oh, wow. That's and amazing. And you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars for one of these whiskeys. So if you're yeah. dedicating yourself and you're making that barrel that a whiskey might live in for 50 years, that's longer than some of the guys who are at the cooperage are still going to be around. Some of these guys have... Yeah are already uh, put a few years in, uh, you you better make sure it's right. It's an expensive mm -hmm. product. and uh, So, yeah, it takes four years, and we've, every year we take on new apprenticeships and we train them up. And uh, that's one of the things I think we're proud of. The family that I work for is really dedicated to not letting these crafts disappear and mm -hmm. training new people to take over all the new positions, which is pretty yeah. cool, I think. So how, roughly how, about how many Coopers do you have and, and how many apprentices, apprentices do you take in on, on a yearly basis? You know, I'm not 100% sure right now. Um, in the Cooperage itself, we have about 15 people, I believe, working at any one time. Um, but they have different, there's only so many of those are fully trained Coopers, some are apprenticeships, some are, uh, uh, for want of a better word, laborers who help moving the casks and checking the casks and sure. different things like that. I'm not 100% sure how many we have. Um, if I had to guess, which is probably not a smart thing to do, I'd probably say we, we have about six fully trained at this moment in time. I know we just um, we just graduated two new Coopers, mm -hmm. which is really good. So we'll be ready to take on a couple more apprenticeships pretty soon. And, and you mentioned it takes about a year for them to get through the apprenticeship process. It takes four years. Four years, four years. Okay. Yeah, four-year right. apprenticeship. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's near enough like a – it's a full-on, like, they don't go to college, but it's a full-on college degree type length, of course. It's four years of training and learning and um, being able to perfect how you do it. I've tried to build one barrel, and I just gave up. I, I wasn't even close to finishing it. It was, it was not uh, going well at all. So it's, it's a lot harder than it looks. Some of these guys can knock them up really quickly, and uh, when you see it, it's pretty amazing. Our, our top guy, Ian McDonald, he's, uh, he's been there. I think he's in his 47th year now, I think, Ian's in. And uh, he's the head cooper, so he's kind of the guy who does a lot of the training and does a lot of demonstrations for us. And the speed he can do, uh, he says he's slowing down a little bit, but I don't believe him. I'd hate to see how fast he was back in his day. But uh, it's pretty amazing how quick he can put up that barrel and put anybody to shame who's trying to do it on their own, thinking it's easy, that's for sure. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that when he does it, he makes it look easy. And then if you try it, you, you go like, oh, my gosh, what am I doing here? <laughs> I know. If, I tell you, and he's got the gift of the gab as well. If he uh, if he ever wants to start traveling the world full time, I think I'd lose my job right away. He's a, he's a really interesting guy. He's got a lot of funny stories because he goes back to before health and safety was a big thing. So he's got all the stories of the camaraderie of working in the Cooperage. So it's, a, it's a cool thing to see. And it's, it, is, it is nice to have that at the distillery because – a lot of distilleries don't have it anymore. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a lot of things are disappearing. Well, what are some of the stories uh, that that, that uh, I think you told us some of the stories about the uh, about sharing some of the uh, the product or well, not officially sharing the product, but the yeah, they used <laughs> to use the whiskey dog and uh, steal the, the whiskey, whiskey dog. dog. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that was a, a thing. It was basically like a metal kind of flask, a little thin metal flask. It looked like a, I always kind of associated with like an aircraft. Um, uh, ammunition type I think it's like a long bullet looking thing uh, so it's a little bit of pipe and it's on a chain they used to hide it down their trouser legs and they would go around the distillery when nobody was looking they would fill it up and then put it back down their trouser legs and they would kind of walk with it and they always called it a whiskey dog because it was man's best friend because you could uh, yeah. steal whiskey with it <laughs> <laughs> the tax man's not so happy with that anymore he gets upset with it so we can't not bad. nobody's allowed to steal anymore yeah that's right <laughs> So uh, now, what role do the uh, the coppersmiths play in the process? Well, I mean, the, uh, one of the things we we have to use is uh, pot stills to make single malt whiskey. And, and basically, there's a couple of different stills. There's a lot of different stills, but two essentially styles of either continuous stills, where as long as you're feeding the raw materials in, 
they're all wash, then the the spirit comes out the top, and it's a continual process. Very technical, makes amazing spirit. Um, to make single malt, we're using pot stills, and that means you're doing it in, in batches individually, essentially boiling liquid to separate the alcohol from water, and you do that. In couple of times, sometimes three times, depending on the distillery, and you're collecting it. But the, the essential part is they're made of copper. And mm. copper, we know in whiskey, reacts very well with the spirit. It actually uh, absorbs things like sulfur out of the whiskey. Mm. And depending on what kind of still you're looking for, you may want a big tall uh, still, because that would give you a nice light whiskey. Or you may want a big wide open short still because that would give you a very um, a thicker, more heavier noted whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on what kind of still you're looking for, every distillery you go to has individually shaped stills. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the role of the coppersmith is to maintain these stills, uh, help to fix them. He's working on because they're, they're slowly degrading over a, a period of about 25, 30 years. They're getting thinner and they can actually implode in themselves, which is really dangerous. Um, but the coppersmith's job is essentially to help with the design, help with maintaining the stills, looking after them, and if need be, to actually build new stills. And uh, our main guy there, Dennis McBain, he's uh, he's been there the longest of anybody at the distilleries. I think he's on his 58th year now, so which is <laughs> nearly 60 years in a little bit. Wow. He's, uh, he's essentially semi-retired. He's still there and he's still helping out, but his job now is training um, he's got a secret apprentice he's working with to actually bring through and uh, we're bringing on a new coppersmith which will be the as far as we know the last coppersmith working for a distillery which is or working directly for a distillery there's amazing coppersmiths in Scotland like Forsyth uh, coppersmiths which makes a lot of stills for American distilleries as well uh -huh. and, uh, but we've uh, Dennis and his uh, prodigy are uh, staying on with William Grant which is really cool it's another one of those crafts that could disappear fairly easily, but the family doesn't want it to happen. That's pretty amazing. It's nice that yeah. they're they're so they're so dedicated to the uh, to keeping the process uh, as uh, as as it was in in many ways. Uh, so, what makes the the Bal Balvany so special compared to to other uh, whiskeys out there? Yeah, I mean, it's, we could go into a lot about all these different people who make it and why that makes a difference. But at the end of the day, it's the whiskey in the bottle, right? It's mm -hmm. the, uh, how we make it makes a big difference to how it tastes in the bottle because we've got all that attention to detail all the way through the process. We've got a lot of experience there as well because like we were saying some of these guys have been there for over half a century dedicating their life to making Balvenie, which is pretty amazing stuff. Um, but for me, the difference with the Balvenie is how balanced it is. A mm -hmm. lot of whiskeys, whether they're new craft distilleries, if they're American, Japanese, Scots, whatever it is, there's a certain flavor profile they're looking for and they are distilleries whiskey. And I think the signature one for Balvenie is it's all honeyed and vanilla and David Stewart, the guy who makes their whiskey, his idea of a really nice whiskey is to be really balanced so that mm. you're not being overpowered by one certain flavor. All these new flavors come together. Um, but he's famous also for doing a thing called cask finishing, which means he moves the whiskey from one type of wood to another Okay. And this allows them to bring in new flavors, which is something he pioneered all the way back in the 80s. And we have things like the Caribbean rum cask, which we tried together. And we had the Portwood 21-year-old, which is finished in a port cask. And uh, I think that's kind of what we're famous for, is being really balanced and relaxing and enjoyable whiskey, mm -hmm. not being overpowering. So it's, it's whiskey that connoisseurs love because there's so much depth of flavor. But anybody new coming in is going to like it too because it's just really balanced and relaxing. It's not overly assertive, which is, I think, a lot of times we overthink things. And sometimes you just want it to be balanced and relaxed. And I know you've got a beautiful cigar there. No, and, yes. Uh, I, <laughs> one of my, I one my favorite. A lot. Yeah. One of my favorites. I, I like Gurk I love Gurkhas. I think they're they're a great cigar. I, I smoke them for special occasions, and uh, this is one of them. Uh, nice. So, yeah. so, uh, whiskey and cigar evening. Whiskey, whiskey cigar, cigar, yeah. Uh, a Gurkha Beast. They they actually have the great marketing with the with the names. They have Evil, <laughs> uh, Beast, Assassin. <laughs> what would you would you think that was a a bold cigar or 
Actually, they're not. Like you don't want to be bold, to be honest with the name, but maybe not. Yeah, it's it's actually a very smooth smoke. It's, it's not harsh, and and one of the things I, I like about the the Gurkhas in general is that they they don't burn hot, even as you get down towards the end. Mm -hmm. They have a they have a nice uh, smooth thing. Uh, the uh, actually the assassin was was a little bit was a little bit uh, uh, was, was a little bit bolder, a little bit stronger. But this one is uh, even though they call it the beast, I don't I don't think, or maybe it's because I smoke right. my cigars at this point. <laughs> that, <laughs> That's one of the things you got to keep in mind, right? Yeah, my, my, my palate, my palate may have be adjusted at this point. Yeah, some things I so, taste some pretty strong whiskeys, and uh, I'm like, oh, that's nice and smooth and light, and I got a completely different reaction from someone else. And yeah, I think that so, may be the good thing about cigars and whiskey as well is, is the uh, the variation you get in these things. Mm -hmm. The amount of different flavors you can get in different cigars, and it blows my mind when I hear people say, oh, I don't like cigars or I don't like whiskey. I'm like. That, that means you've tasted a lot of things could, to cancel out a whole category. <laughs> There's a lot of different styles out there you might like. So, All right. so I want to talk a little bit about enjoying the the, the, uh, the whiskey and the particular glass. Now, I got I got a snifter here, and I've also, you know, some people use regular glasses. What's the advantages of different kinds of glasses, and what does it do to the uh, to the uh, to the aroma and the and the taste yeah. of the scotch? So I've got a little Glen Cairn glass here. These are actually made in my hometown of Glasgow. Um, kind of become one of the, the standard for nosing and tasting whiskey. Uh -huh. um, there's another glass, the Copita, that was is used at the distillery a lot, which is a similar design to this, but with a much thinner base, uh, which is, looks really pretty, but it breaks a lot. So it's not really great for home bars or especially in restaurants. Mm. Um, so these are really good for that. Essentially what you're looking for, you've got a perfect glass there as well that it actually is going to collect the liquid, allow the vapor to kind of, um, the aroma to concentrate so you can nose it. Because nosing, as we all know, 70% of what you're tasting is what you're nosing. So that allows the kind of whiskey to collect, allows the aroma to collect, and allows us to get a really good nose. If it's too wide a glass, uh, aroma escapes too easily, and you don't get all the aroma you get in your whiskey. But on top of that, though, I mean, we've got the 12 double wood here, which is pretty much my daily dram. And I'm not going to put this in this glass because I know oh. what it smells like. As soon as I smell a little bit, all those memories just trigger. And there's nothing better than just having a nice solid rocks glass in your hand, a nice crystal glass or even just a regular glass. And oh. um, I would think there's, there's a difference between nosing whiskey and just enjoying it. When you're sure. nosing it, you're trying to break it down. Something like this is really good. Um, if you're just enjoying it, any glass works. I've been out in a boat out in the middle of the ocean, and it was a plastic tumbler with some bar from New Orleans <laughs> written on the side, and the whiskey tasted just fine. So yes, it does. It does. It's all on the occasion. It, it yeah. does. So, uh, um, so we in the states put a lot of ice in our stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, t tell us a little bit about uh, the the. Uh, the the ice and what does it do? Was it what does it do to the uh, taste and the flavor of, of of the whiskey that we're drinking? And then in general, liquor. Yeah, so we've always got a, a little bit of a mix because it's it's that ironic thing of water helps open up the whiskey, but ice kind of helps it close down a little bit. Um, and essentially, what's happening again with the aroma? You're if you remember your old high school chemistry when you're heating up I, a liquid, it gets really excited and I, it's. I was, was just going to say this. This is where your environmental science comes in handy. Yeah. <laughs> knowing a little bit helps a little bit, yeah. Gets me in trouble just knowing a little too much. Um, but you can, uh, when it actually starts heating up a liquid, it obviously boils and all the molecules get excited and release. When you're uh, freezing a liquid, all the molecules lock together. So essentially what freezing does or putting ice in whiskey is it doesn't really affect the flavor as much as it affects the aroma. Mm -hmm. And because you what you okay. smell – generates what you taste a lot. When you lose a lot of the aroma, you're going to lose a lot of what you taste. Um, it will make it refreshing, and it'll make it tasty, and it'll make it nice. And if we're sitting in Arizona in the middle of July, we're out in a patio, I am probably <laughs> going to add some ice, you know? Sure. It's, um, but if you're paying a lot of money for a good single malt whiskey, you maybe just want to add a little touch of water. Um, if it's a whiskey you know very well and you want to try it in a different way, Add some ice. Add a splash of soda water. I, I find it really refreshing before dinner. A uh, little 12 double wood with a splash of uh, chilled soda water in there makes it really refreshing. Brings out all the honeyness in the whiskey more. And I, uh, 
I think we again we overthink it too much. But if you are going to spend a little bit of money, we had the the twenty one year old Portwood in, in Arizona when I was down there. It's two hundred and fifty dollars a bottle. Yeah, might want to not add ice to it because it's you're, you're not going to get what you taste, what you paid for. Yeah. And the the depth of flavor in there is is meant for just in, enjoying on its own and maybe a touch of water. Um, I actually do like adding chilled water though. Um, because whiskey, okay. I like to think it, it does really well around about that 60, 63 degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's in Celsius. I can't even do my, my metric conversions yet to Fahrenheit as well. Um, but if we're doing it about that temperature, then it's it's usually warmer where we are, in the mm-hmm. bar or wherever it's going to be warm. And that. So a little bit of chilled water when I'm adding water to whiskey will bring it down a little bit and will actually help it open up, which is kind of nice, I think. Sounds good. It's kind of if we think about the same temperature as red wine, that's mm. generally what I want my whiskey to be. Okay. That temperature. Sounds sounds good. So uh, let's kind of. I was going to switch here to uh, take a little bit of this uh, double sure. double and try and try a little taste of that. And uh, why don't you tell us as as I'm pouring this? See if I can make uh, the best sound in uh, TV and radio. There! Oh my gosh, you got it! Oh man, that is the best you, sound you, can get. you are a true professional. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's see if I can let's see if I can mimic that. It's beautiful. Wow. It's a great sound. It is a sound. <laughs> so this is the twelve-year-old Doublewood. This is kind of the, and I've got my own fancy little water dropper here because we got to show off sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, well, here, I'll, I'll uh, I have my little teaspoon. That's perfect, quarter, yeah. Quarter teaspoon. <laughs> You're all measured out. You're way more fancy than I am. I got um, but this is the 12-year-old double wood. Give you a little uh-huh. thing. Just, yeah, I, I'll uh, do the same and, here. Uh, this is aged for 12 years in American oak. Uh, we love that kind of ex bourbony flavor of vanilla and honey and caramel notes. Uh-huh. But we call this the double wood, and this is one of the things I've seen that David does. He moves whiskey from one type of cask to another and he actually moves it into a European sherry cask after this from down in uh, Oloroso sherry from Spain and it brings out this fruity nuttiness in the whiskey so compared to the first one which was only aged in American oak this one is aged in American oak and European oak so mm-hmm. I always kind of talk about this one being the perfect balance of American and European flavors uh-huh. a little bit of the sweetness and then a little bit of the kind of nutty fruitiness on the back end this is for me, this is just the perfect relaxing whiskey. Mm-hmm. This is the one when I get off work and I don't want to think about anything. I just want to sit at the bar or sit at home and have a whiskey without having to overanalyze it. This is the perfect one. It really has a very, very uh, it, it has a very different taste than the than the uh, the single barrel. It's 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 yeah. It, it's a uh, it's kind of it's amazing. You know, I, I've always found it is that when you test liquors side by side when you taste them side by side you really get appreciation of what they what they taste like differently rather than if you like have one and then like another few days later uh it's just, it's just really kind of nice to be able to taste them side by side yeah, um, yeah definitely and this if you think about it the 12 year old single barrel the 12 year old double wood is the same whiskey that just moved into a sherry cask for nine months and that okay. little nine months has just changed that flavor completely so it's the same liquid at the beginning, and it just takes a little nine-month finish in sherry and completely changes the, the whiskey. So it's, it's amazing the skill the guys have at the distillery to make these things happen because there's a little bit of magic involved. Yeah, I imagine they, they pour very carefully from one uh, barrel into another. I can imagine, yeah. You know, I've actually <laughs> never seen it done. I've never seen it done. Actually, I need to put that on my wish list the next time I go back to the distillery. I'm going, yeah. in, I'm going next month. I need to go see how they actually do it. Now, did they use the, the barrels more than once or just one time use on the, on the barrels? So in America, they can only use them once, uh, uh-huh. which is great for us because then we can get the barrels off them because there's a okay. lot of aging left in the barrels. Some people estimate like 50 years. Some people say more. But um, in America, you can only use them once by law to make bourbon. So okay. that's why we can use bourbon barrels at the distillery in Scotland because there's lots of leftover barrels. So mm-hmm. they ship them over, and our coopers, our, our cooperage will look after them. They'll check them, make sure they're good, do whatever repairs need to be done. And then we will uh, we'll use them. And now we can use them as many times as we want. Um, and we want to use them a lot of times because what that does is if we have all our whiskey aging in the, in the exact same way, mm-hmm. then David Stewart doesn't have anything to play with later on. 
He has sure. no uh, different variations. So we're not looking for, sometimes we want to release single barrels, but really what we're looking for is a lot of variation in our warehouse mm -hmm. so that David can hand select barrels to recreate what he's looking to do. So having first fill and what we call refill barrels and traditional barrels, that gives him a lot of different options to use. So we're, yeah, we use them generally twice, sometimes three times if it's a really active barrel, but um, we just want variation. That's what we're really looking for. So we can give the people with all the skill a, a huge palette of ingredients to work with. Okay. How, how does, how do you, um, uh, um, how do you determine that the barrel is done? It can't be used again. What's, what, what happens to the barrel? Um, it's probably a combination of uh, the cooperage and David himself uh, making that determination. He'd be able to tell from the whiskey how much the barrel is impertinent to the whiskey. If it's mm -hmm. still aging the whiskey further as he's doing checks over years. Um, the coopers themselves can look at barrels and it's uncanny how they can just look at a piece of wood and know how much life is in there and how much more energy it's got left. It's pretty amazing. I stood with him once and we walked around a barrel and he's like, point at the four staves that are broken need to be fixed. And I could not see them. And he basically scraped a little bit and you saw a crack underneath what he just scraped. I have no idea how he could see it, knew it, just sensed it. It was pretty amazing stuff. Um, so yeah, it's basically a combination of everybody working together at the distillery to, to use their experience to decide when the barrel's done and when it goes to become a flower pot at a garden center. That's generally where they end up. Yeah, and oh, that's that's what I was going. That was going to be my next question. So, what happens with the wood once it's done? What, uh, what, what? I mean, we can do. There's lots of different things. The running joke is they all become flower pots because you go to garden centres in Scotland, you can buy them, and you go buy any hotel. That's what all their flowers are outside the hotels. They're all in old whiskey barrels. Oh, okay. Um, but there's a lot of different uses. I mean, they can use them to uh, burn to rechar barrels. They can just recycle them into things. Um, yeah, once they're done, they're kind of uh, ornaments at that point. There's not much yeah. we can do with them. I think some of them may turn into humidors too. We've made a humidor, yeah. Our friend Daniel Marshall made <laughs> That's the, right. uh, a beautiful humidor. Uh, yeah. He's he's a good friend actually. He lives out this way in California near me, and we do a lot of work together. And uh, he made one out of um, an old port cast that we used uh, to make a fifty-year-old Balvenie. And uh, well, it was a fifty-year-old. It was a twenty-one-year-old Balvenie, but it, the port cast itself was fifty years old. And he took that cast when it was already had served its purpose and he repurposed it into a beautiful humidor and I love the fact that he left the sides and the wood and the outside raw um, uh -huh. so you can see exactly what it looked like inside was all beautifully finished because obviously you don't want it flavoring the cigars right uh, but the outside was the beautiful raw cask itself so it was beautiful workmanship on how he managed to pull that off uh -huh. and keep it elegant inside but raw on the outside it was pretty beautiful yeah, we certainly enjoyed having him uh, a, f a few months ago on the interviewing him and talk, talk. He's a he's a truly a, a gentleman, truly a truly a gentleman. So uh, the angels portion. Yeah. So uh, let's let's talk about that and how it relates to the age of a of a scotch and uh, and uh, what what is that for some people that may not be familiar with that term. So there's a, a thing called the angel share, um, which is a kind of a fun little reference to the amount of whiskey that escapes out the barrel as it's aging in Scotland. So uh -huh. the barrel itself, the wood is not sealed with anything. It's not wrapped in plastic or any sort of sealing on the outside. It's the original wood. Um, so for that nature, it is porous, just like all wood is essentially, if you don't treat it. And because of that, as the whiskey's aging, it's, it's moving in and out the wood. It's breathing as the humidity and temperature changes, the whiskey and the liquid moves in and out. And it fills the pores and then comes back in. So we're extracting flavor from the wood. But the magical part is that some of the alcohol vapors actually escape and some of the mm -hmm. liquid escapes out the barrel and it evaporates into the air. And that's what we call the angel share. Mm -hmm. And the angel share is the amount of whiskey we lose every year as whiskey ages. Mm -hmm. So it's estimated it's about 2% to 1.5% a year, which doesn't sound that much. A lot of uh, places like in America, much higher. Places mm -hmm. like uh, Thailand, even higher again because of the high humidity and heat. But we age our whiskey for so long. Our 50-year-old Balvenie lost 75% of the barrel. Yeah, and compounding interest. 
Yeah, I did the math on it, and it was uh, $11.4 million of whiskey evaporated from one barrel. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Which, which obviously is why that whiskey was nearly $40,000 for one bottle, which is <laughs> pretty insane how much it costs. That, but that uh, is... when you think of what's happening and how much, it, how long it takes, something it takes 50 years to make, yeah. I can't sure. really think of anything else it takes that long to make and what the price would be if it took – if it took a car maker 50 years to complete one car, how much would the car be worth? I mean, it's mm -hmm. just it's these, it's these kind of things we're talking about. And uh, but what's cool with the angel share is we actually is the as we lose things in the barrel, oxygen comes in and actually oxygenates the the whiskey inside, and that's where we start to get these unique flavors that don't really exist in the wood or the spirit. It just starts to develop through the the interaction of oxygen and the angel share leaving, which is so we want the angel share. We need it. Sure. Uh, but sometimes they get a little greedy, especially if people have got the whiskey dog with them. They blame on the angels <laughs> here a lot. Stealing a little whiskey sometimes gets blamed on the angels. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, you kind of alluded to this, but I kind of want what's uh, what do you see on the horizon in terms of that's going to be different, that technology may change in the, the whole distilling process? Um, I don't know if too much. Um, as far as the technology changing, I don't see it being too much. I mean, we've got – I can see things happening in the lab where we can analyze the whiskey and see what's going on there. There's a lot of equipment where we can actually break down a whiskey once it's in a glass and see what exactly we got from there. Um, there's ways to control temperature and things like that. They've done a lot of work on this. I don't see it being a huge influence on the whiskey industry itself. Where I see influence coming in is – the new craft distilleries, being able to work with different types of barley. Um, so they're opening up all the different types of uh, barley strains that we can use. Uh, we can't use any GMOs or anything like that, but we've got a lot of heirloom barley grains that we haven't worked with in a while. Uh, a lot of different yeast strains that we can try out. Most of the distilleries in Scotland are using the same yeast strains, essentially. Uh, so there's a lot of work on new yeast strains, um, different size stills, smaller stills, smaller casks. So I think the new craft distilleries that we're opening up have a lot of creative freedom because they're not as they're not as big. They're not producing as much whiskey, so they've got a little bit more freedom to do some experimenting and seeing what's going on. Uh, so there's a lot of experience experiment there, um, and then we're also experimenting with a lot of different. Uh, a lot of new uh, types of casks are coming into the whiskey world where we're getting to finish whiskey in old beer casks now. Um, so our friends at Glen Fiddick, our sister distillery, made a whiskey that was finished in an IPA cask made okay. of a uh, Scottish IPA. So we're starting to see like IPA casks being used and cider casks being used. And uh, they've been trying to recently try to get tequila casks involved. So ex tequila casks being used to age whiskey, which... Uh, I don't know. Sometimes we can stray a little too far from the tradition. And yeah. uh, we actually, if you stray too far from tradition, then you can't actually do it. Yeah. Uh, there's a, kind of a watchdog agency that if you can't prove it's a traditional way that whiskey used to be made, then you can't do new things. So yeah. well, there's a fine line. You can't go too far. So let's talk about, since we're talking about different things, this Caribbean. Oh, yeah. One of the people's favorites right now. I'm going to go and pour, pour a little bit of that while you're talking about it. Yeah, this is, and you can tell I like mine because I've only got a little tiny bit left in my bottle. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, a, a lot of people are thinking is one of their favorites these days. This is the Caribbean rum cask, and it's aged for 14 years in American oak, and then we move it into a cask that used to hold Caribbean rum. And David Sure, the guy who makes our whiskey, he actually is a big fan of aged rum as well. I'm actually going to finish my double wood first here. <laughs> Can't be wasting that whiskey now. Um, he's actually a big fan of aged rum as well. So he's actually made his own uh, special blend of rum that we use to season barrels. And we're able to now season barrels so we get the perfect wood, the perfect um, seasoning with rum in these barrels. And so after 14 years of aging in American oak, those ex-bourbon barrels we were talking about, he's uh, we move it into those rum casks. And it's in there for about four months, roughly, four to six months, mm -hmm. but mostly four months. And um, it's amazing how it changes and brings out those chocolatey rum molasses notes in the whiskey. So it's still right on the nose, 
it's all balvenie it's all honey and vanilla but it's a it's kind of taking that honey and vanilla and making it more tropical and a little bit more of the kind of dark chocolate notes coming out but my favorite thing you do with people is when you have a sip of this whiskey rub the tongue against the roof of your mouth and that's where you'll get this chocolatey orange molasses note coming out it's just this beautiful kind of it's got a little spice note to it but it's that chocolatey orange finish that you get on this whiskey is it's pretty special this is uh I always kind of laugh is why is this whiskey becoming so everybody's favorite and it's because it tastes like things that people know yeah it smells kind of honeyed and tropical and it tastes of spice with chocolate and orange and molasses on the finish it's all things that people know it's people it's things that they recognize so if you're new to whiskey or you're a connoisseur and you're picking up this bottle you're like i understand this whiskey it makes sense to me and i think that's why it's becoming so popular and it tastes really freaking good which is even better <laughs> that's great that's great so um how do, how uh if you want to really enjoy this uh and have some friends over what's the what's the best way to throw a tasting party i would yeah i guess there's a lot because people will start to get whiskey collections and they collect whiskey and there's so many different options from America and Irish as we were mentioned in the Scottish whiskey but they all taste so unique and I think this is the the amazing thing and I for this bottle not too long but if I could keep this bottle six months it's going to taste the same it's going mm -hmm. to be fine and that's the kind of joy of it's not like wine as soon as you open it you're now in a race to make sure it doesn't go off before you enjoy the whole bottle um, so people are now finding out they've got collections of whiskey and they want to bring people around and friends around and that's the sense of what whiskey is it's meant for bringing people together and telling stories and hanging out and having a good time um so my thing is always bring people around who are going to enjoy it bring people around who are going to relax and not make any a big show because it's meant to be relaxing mm -hmm. uh provide a little food um, even if it's just things like crackers and cheese, something to cleanse the palate, <clears throat> whiskey works really good with food. It works really good with things like cheese and chocolate and things like that. Um, so a little food, make sure you've got water so people can cleanse the palate and actually dilute the whiskey down a little bit. Because if you're going to taste a few, you want to keep that palate fresh. So a lot of people get a little weird. They don't want to dilute the whiskey. They don't want to do anything. You'll dare to try four or five whiskeys. If you have four or five whiskeys, at full strength and cast strength and all these kind of weird things your palate can only take so much it mm -hmm. is a strong spirit it's meant to be enjoyed in little sips if you drink it quick it doesn't taste good it physically forces you to slow down and enjoy it because if you drink it quick it doesn't taste good and that for me is the the best thing about whiskey is it physically makes you slow down and these days that's the one thing we don't do enough of is Take a little minute, put the TV off, put the phone to the side and have a whiskey. Sit in your man cave in Arizona and have a cigar and a whiskey. That's right. I know That's you're right. doing right now. <laughs> That's right. So uh, I'm going to take a little turn here on you. Sure. Uh, oh, and uh, so, David, I, I need, uh, I'm going to ask you a political question. And uh, as, a, as a Scotsman, okay. uh, I'd, like, I, I'd like to get your opinion on the uh, urn brew controversy in Scotland. I saw a little bit of this. I didn't know where you were going with that, there, and I was like, whiskey and politics never mix, but maybe I can try to take this one on for you. Um, I am an iron brew aficionado. Oh, my gosh. Out there who is not an iron brew lover or hasn't tasted it, you what? may be missing out on one of the best things ever invented by man. Yeah. So what, what, what is it? Tell our folks what it is. Iron brew is a gift from the gods, essentially. It is a soda made in Scotland. <laughs> no one's 100% sure what it's made of. We probably yes. don't want to know. Um, we are fairly certain it's the only thing known to manicure a hangover. That's pretty much giving. You mix that with a good Scottish breakfast, you're good to go for the day. Uh, but in all seriousness, it's probably... Oh, hag uh, haggis. Haggis. Haggis well, if you're having haggis for breakfast, you're, you're having a really good day right there. Um, <laughs> But a little black pudding, some potato scones, and square sausage, and a can iron brew. You are good to go, my friend. Um, but it's a it's a carbonated, caffeinated sugar soda and scone, and a eight, nice eight, eight eight and a half teaspoons of sugar in per can. Wow, 
I, I don't want to downplay it, but I, I think Coca Cola must be more than that, no? I don't know. It definitely wakes you up. Let's put it that way. Um, but they had a little controversy where they decided they wanted to change the formula of Iron Brew recently. Mm-hmm. And they were going to artificially sweeten it, I believe. I've been over here for a little bit, so I only got the tail end of all the, the arguments. Yeah. But I've started seeing people posting on YouTube them doing taste tests side by side, and they're not being able to tell the difference one between the other. So that's a good sign for Scotland. And I don't know if you know this or not, but Scotland, Iron Brew is the only country in the world that outsells Coca-Cola. The, so- the number one soda in the country is not Coca-Cola. Wow, and that's Scotland, amazing. Because Iron Brew outsells Coca-Cola in Scotland. Well, you have the, the so in this article in the Wall Street Journal today. Oh, yeah. uh, that's where oh, I, I just read the Wall Street Journal. Okay, yeah, this was a little bit ago in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. So, so they were talking about it. basically it's a, the, the soda tax was 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 a yeah, big issue. Yeah, so they're starting to go. And and, and, I, and this this caught my eye. This gentleman said, "Yes, I almost lost all my teeth, but it was worth it." <laughs> There is a dying brew version, in case anybody's wondering, but um, I never felt it was quite as effective. Uh, but it is, it's, it's amazing when you go to Scotland, it's the first thing you see when you get off the airport, they're selling it everywhere, and it's, I think it's delicious. I think it's amazing. It's been described to me, it tastes a little bit like bubble gum, which I don't get, but I've heard it a, a few times, so I'm going to take their word for it, and they've had a little... That might be what it tastes like to the untrained, non-Scottish palate, shall we say. Okay. Um, but it's delicious. Go try it. You can find okay. it some places in the U.S. Some of these yeah. uh, British import stores will, will stock it. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll have to look for it. I'll have to look for it. Cause, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after reading that article, I mean, you just got to try it. You got to at least try it once. I got to be honest. As soon as I get back to Scotland, it is one of the first things I get. And Do good you? chocolate as well. We got to get good chocolate. <laughs> guys are... Uh, you guys do things very well in America. Chocolate's one of those things we gotta we gotta get the good European chocolate over here. Ah, uh, okay. So the old guy is all about. Uh, we've been talking. Well, we've been talking about vices, and a lot of times I'm talking about virtues as my guest. But yeah. I'm gonna continue down this vices uh, track here. I, I always have a few questions about my my guest's vices. Sure. And <laughs> he says, "Okay, another turn." Um, no, this is not going to be bad. This is not going to be bad. So if you were to compete in an Olympic event, summer or winter, what would it be? Mm, I always wanted to do the decathlon. There's a guy when I was growing up a long, long time ago called Daley Thompson, and he was like one of those British heroes, and he competed in the decathlon, and I always looked amazing because it was the all-round sport. So for me, it looked like the same one as you would do as a kid. You just run and jump and throw things and do things, and uh-huh. it sounded like amazing. Now I kind of – I'm obviously not anywhere good enough to do any of that, those things. Um, I like – you ever seen the movie Eddie the Eagle? Did you watch yes. that movie? Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to do a ski jump now. Okay. And I kind of want to do it because I have no ability to ski. I've never skied in my life. Uh-huh. And it's kind of his whole story. So I think I want to start up skiing and then become a ski jumper because it looks like you're just basically trying to risk your life and not die yeah. all the time. And it's a really funny movie, actually, if you haven't seen it. It's oh, yeah, a it's, it's a good and, movie. Uh, yeah. But I, I think I can do uh, Yeah, I'll do a ski jump. Yeah. Okay. Enough. What would you do? Yeah. I'm going to turn uh, it back on you. Well, okay. Well, I, I, actually, I love powerlifting. That's that's my favorite thing. So I'd like to do powerlifting, but uh, I, I think actually one of the most the weirdest stories of this year's Olympics is the uh, the uh, the Russian juicing scandal by the by the curling guy. I never knew curling required juicing. I just we, <laughs> I'm uh, <always> <laughs> I, I I read that and it reminded me of an old story of we have this game called snooker back home. Uh, which is similar to pool, but on a much bigger table and much I've, slower I've, game. In my in my youth, I've played that. Yeah. Yeah. So very slow game, very tactical, and as the guy I'm thinking by must have been thirty years now. They started bringing in drug testing for all the snooker players, and I'm like, why would you need this for any part of snooker? So I think they were. Uh, that reminds me of that. Why you need drugs for curling and why would you need it for snooker i have no idea i mean of so, all the sports 
<laughs> and why would you even test the curlers? Who thought to test them? I mean, it's just like <laughs> sliding takes a lot of energy. You gotta be yeah. get that your room. Stamina up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, maybe uh, faster, it's, faster yeah. brushing. I don't know what they were up to. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Um, I, I get into a lot of different things. My dad was a big uh, blues and Motown guy growing up. Uh -huh. So I, I used to listen to a lot of that growing up in Scotland. And my, my grandmother was a big country music person. So I grew up listening to all the George Jones and Conway Twitty and all these kind of people back in the old days. Um, but now I've started doing a little bit online where I pair Balvenny to different blues music and different rock musicians where I just have uh -huh. got a nice little vinyl collection. And I I just every Friday I'll just pick a whiskey and then pick a – um, an old vinyl record and pair them together and see what works out. And so I guess I, it's kind of varied, but definitely a lot of blues and, and uh, blues, old rock, I guess, some old country, that kind of stuff. It's very, really, my wife gets really embarrassed by me because I don't know a lot of modern music. She's uh, if we're at some place and something's on, I have zero idea what's going on. No. Yeah. <laughs> Same here. It's, it's not my wife, it's my kids. And they say like, you, so who is that? I have no idea. Uh, if you are eating something in the closet that you don't want people to know that you eat, what would that be? Probably a six pack of Iron Brew, I think, is what I'm drinking. I'm just a closet drinking Iron Brew since before they changed the formula. That's right. Uh, it's a six pack and you come out Superman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I could run a marathon on a six-pack of Iron Brew. Um, I'm a bit of a chocoholic. I love chocolate, and I get a care package all the time from the UK. And uh, My mum will send me a little of the good dairy milk, which actually and, uh, it, it just it tastes different, whatever the difference is between the UK and the, this, the US version of chocolate. But my wife likes it too, so I have to kind of hide it. So if I was probably sneaking away, it would be to – eat the chocolate gift pack that we, the care packages we got over from the UK. That's probably what I was hiding. Okay. When you're not drinking the Balvany, what, what, what else would you be drinking? I, f I wish I could actually turn around. I'm just looking. My wife would go nuts if I turned this around because it's so messy over to my left here. I've got my, my back bar is over here, my little mini bar. And it's, it's stocked with a lot of different things. Um, we, we drink a lot of gin. Um, if I'm making cocktails, I'm definitely – I'm probably more maybe going towards a gin cocktail than uh -huh. anything else. Um, but saying that, it just varies so much. We've got – we were out uh, on Saturday night, and we went to a tequila bar, and uh, we tried some beautiful tequila. And we hung out there. Um, I like going to check out new beer. And I think the big thing that's happened in the spirits and beer world, maybe not as much in the wine world, but maybe I'm wrong on that as well, is the amount of creativity going on. And the amount of bars who are willing to stock it, and you walk in a regular bar now, the, the options are so huge. Sure. And I tell people, it's like, go find a good bartender who knows, because just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. Mm. And just because it's local doesn't mean it's good either. And there's a lot of really good local producers, a lot of really experimental guys who are doing a lot of good things, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of crap out there, truth be told. Yeah. And get to know your bartender the way it used to be in the olden days where you'd sit down and they, everybody knew your name and all that kind of good stuff. Get to know your bartender is near enough as important these days for letting him guide you through all the stuff behind the bar. And I, I always go back to cigars as well. When you go into oh, buy sorry. a cigar, having, that, uh, having somebody guide you through all those numerous cigars that I think last year with the change in the, the laws, there was so many cigars released all at once. Or was that two years ago now? Oh, that's right. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, Daniel was talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Beat, so many beat cigars beat come out at once. You need someone to guide you through. So find that good bartender will help you guide you through. But yeah, there's there's lots of good stuff out there. I I tend to jump around a lot, to be honest. Yeah, we have a lot of craft bars uh, yeah. out here in Scott in uh, in Arizona. It's nice to be able to walk in and watch them make uh, stuff with you know basically uh, with with all fresh ingredients and, and kind of put it all together in a very creative way. Um, what would someone be surprised? Like, I can't believe he does that. What would that be? With my whiskey, probably uh, how many times I experiment with the whiskey, I think. Okay. Um, I've made cocktails with really expensive whiskey, which uh -huh. people would go nuts at. Uh, there's actually um, a hotel down in 
uh, Newport that has a 40 year old Balvenie cocktail on the menu. Oh, wow. Uh, it's $1,000 for one cocktail. Yeah. Which, which hotel is that? That is at the Montage Hotel down in uh, Newport Beach. And the, it's actually a pretty cool experiment. They actually donate half the money to charity. Okay. Which is kind that, of that's actually in in, uh, in Laguna, Dana Point. Yep, so that's exactly the one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. We, yeah. I said Newport, yeah, down in Laguna. Yeah, no, and, I, uh, we've actually stayed there, so that's actually – well, I don't think I'll be ordering that anytime soon, but – You can have one, it's there, they can give it, and there's still a lot of them. And it's for charity, it's for charity as well, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, so that's really um, – I, I tend to think that the whiskey is beautiful on its own, but it's also it's made to be enjoyed. And if you want to enjoy it a, a different way, that's fun. Um, I think people get amazed. I'm, I've been married 10 years, which is people don't think that. I travel all the time, so people get a little confused by that one, I think. That must be uh, very hard. It's a little tough. I mean, it's uh, you, you get used to it. You need a very... Uh, understanding loving partner i guess sure um and she's amazing we've been together for forever and a day been, i've always did this job since we've been together um and okay. one state another not with balvenie the whole time but with uh, travel and things like that um but you just kind of find that work-life balance and you work it out and if, whether you're traveling or you're having to go away and work in oil rigs or travel for other work or be a truck driver just having the family, the strong family, makes a big difference. It doesn't matter what the job is, really. You got to have somebody who supports you. You could be in the office eighteen hours a day. It's just the same as being away, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's the uh, the most important decision uh, any man and or and any woman will make is uh, who they uh, choose as their partner in their life. There's no doubt about it. You, if you pick good, it's wonderful. If you pick bad. <laughs> Oh my God! It is a shit storm, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we've seen we've seen that, haven't we? <laughs> oh, I, I bartended for a long time, so I've heard every story under the book. Sitting at that bar, uh, crying into the drink. So it's a, yeah. Yeah, when you find a good one, you got to hang on. I think that's a yeah. The best I did that. You can get. Yeah, I did that during. Uh, I worked through school too, and, and uh, I bartended for about six years. And uh, uh, it was actually uh, it was uh, it was a very pleasurable job. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad I did it, and. Uh, you know, but it was, it was, I have lots of fond memories. So, well, David, I want to thank you for coming pleasure, on yeah. the old guy show. It was a pleasure. And, uh, we learned a lot, uh, about Scotch whiskey, especially about the, the Balvenie and the, and the, the particular process and how they work to, uh, maintain the quality uh, through the process and the integrity of the of the way that it was that you know it's been done for years and the the uh, how they really work to keep that knowledge uh, and that skill and that professionalism to keep it going. So uh, really appreciate you spending time tonight with us and uh, and talking about it. And uh, we'll look forward maybe sometime to uh, catching up with you either here when you come to Phoenix or maybe when I'm in Los Angeles. I'd love to get together with you and Daniel and have a cigar and, and a, and a, and a um, and, and, a, and a drink. You're always welcome, my friend. And Thank um, you. we'll be down in Arizona pretty soon. So okay, well let let uh, let, let me know and I'll we'll be back down that way. Oh wonderful, wonderful. So folks, that's all we got Cheers. for you tonight. This is Orsi Old Guy from www.oldguytalks.com. We have had David Laird, ambassador <laughs> to Bal to D I can't pronounce it. How do you pronounce it so nicely? D Balvenie. How do you pronounce, you pronounce it so nice? That is perfect right there. That was the best one right there. Oh, I don't know. I think nice you, and soft. And, uh, I think, as soon as you get two whiskeys, it all sounds so much better. Yeah, oh, I know. The yeah, yeah, no, yeah, the more you drink, the, the smarter <laughs> you are, the better looking you are, and the funnier you are. Uh, <laughs> we all know that. As I've already told you, if you have not already opted in, do so now, and I will send you my three ways how to get laid more frequently without begging. Uh, no need to turn in your man card. No need to be begging. So this is Orsi Old Guy signing off. And remember, it's all about creating a kick-ass life, guys. It's all about creating a kick-ass life for yourself and those that you love. Thanks for listening to this podcast. And subscribe, rate, and review us, please. That's right. 
subscribe, rate, and review us. If you like this, there's more of me at www.oldguytalks.com. Opt in there and you'll get my three ways to get laid without begging. That's right, three ways to get laid more often without begging. This is Oris, the old guy from www.oldguytalks.com. Subscribe, rate, and review. And if you don't like me, well, review me too. Give me a bad review, a bad one, a really bad one. Opt in and encourage other old guy assholes like you to opt in also.